Um, I think that the discussion group did a great job of discussing the complexities of defining and understanding what family is, right? This has been a larger scale problem that uh, we've noticed, right, where if we attempt to have a really fixed static definition of family, who is included in that definition, who is excluded in that definition, um, over time, right, especially in the 1950s, there was a really large emphasis on the so-called nuclear family, right, which was a heterosexual married couple with two kids, uh, as the discussion group mentioned, that doesn't quite make sense. Uh, this was, of course, also at a time where there was a lot of concern surrounding uh, nuclear weapons, uh, the potential for war and violence, and so on. Um, over time, of course, and throughout history, we've seen a lot of different models of family and relationships that um, definitely break that mold. Uh, and we've seen this in a more visible way now uh, more than ever. One important way to think about family and defining family and communication is the importance of culture. Depending on culture, context, and situation, historically, the ways that we've defined and understood family is very different. Um, oftentimes, when we see kind of contemporary discussion for instance, discussions surrounding political and social issues, one of the things that comes up is an emphasis on how issues impact families, right? Um, for instance, there's been a lot of concern surrounding school curriculum in K through 12. That's been a major area of contemporary debate and disagreement. And one of the many arguments that's made in those situations is a concern about family, about children, and so on. Uh, but it's important for us to recognize that not every definition of family uh, fits in a super narrow way. Family can mean a lot of different things to you. Uh, one major uh, term that we've seen come up a lot more is this idea of chosen family. I like the way the discussion group brought up uh, the idea of having people like roommates or close friends that are really uh, important or significant to somebody. Um, when I was in college, right, rather than visiting family one year, uh, back at home, I had kind of members of close family and relationships that I found as important uh, as a set of people that I chose to um, visit and spend time with for Thanksgiving. So there's a lot of different ways that we can understand family, and because uh, the definition is so broad, it can cover a lot of different cultures and experiences. I thought that the group did a good job of defining family, so I'm not going to have a super long discussion about this definition, just to point out a couple major things to know, right? Uh, the idea here is that, of course, it's two or more people. Um, the things that might define and tie uh, family members together could be more codified, right? Something such as marriage or civil union. Um, again, having a blood relationship um, or through things such as adoption might also be ways that we can define family. But again, choice plays a really big part here, too, especially in people who might not have certain family members that are with them or certain family members that they're on speaking terms with or able to have a close relationship to, uh, choice plays a really big role here. Um, family members don't necessarily have to live together. In fact, for many of us who are you know, away from home for college, um, that's a reality. And maybe for you, it's the first time you've spent a significant chunk of your life away from family. So that's uh, living with somebody is not necessarily an element. Um, having interaction within what we might consider to be family roles, right? Um, you can kind of think about the family as an inside of a watch, where there's a lot of gears turning and spinning. Uh, in the modern family clip, right, there were so many different things going on, right? You had this kind of uh, history of farming and of treating uh, the two kids kind of like they were bulls in a kind of funny way. Um, there was this kind of holiday uh, focus too, uh, you know, the gingerbread and all of that stuff. There was a focus on differences in romantic and sexual attraction, right? Uh, there were a lot of different things at play. And when you're thinking about and examining family in the context of media, there's a lot of those little details and things that are coming up, maybe related to self-disclosure, culture, tradition, and so on. You know, there's a reason that if you have the kind of classic uh, family dinner table set up where people are disagreeing about a lot of topics, um, but that becomes this really heated or dynamic place uh, for people to relate to each other because of the history and context that family members might have. Which ties to the idea of a common culture, that there's a set of shared experiences, values, beliefs, and so on, 
or ways that family members might diverge from those beliefs. Economic cooperation right, is an element too, um, and there is a really wide spectrum. So depending on the family arrangement, people could have like shared accounts like credit cards, right, or they could do uh, entirely separate. So there's been a lot more of a shift uh, toward even through things like marriage, um, more financial independence in terms of the types of accounts and so on that might be created. Uh, so having children, right, is not necessarily a requirement of family either. Um, so it's important to think about how um, the presence or absence, right, of children might play a role in finding and understanding family. Boundaries and mutual affection, of course, matter too. One thing to think about if we think back to uncertainty reduction theory is that as a relationship gets closer, there's greater comfort with the idea that a relationship uh, might have its ups and downs, that you get into a fight, maybe you're not speaking for a while, and then you resume contact with somebody else. So because of a lot of the bonds and closeness we might feel uh, through family members, um, which of course could change over time, we can define who is in or out of our family differently over time, that there's a lot of um, overall feelings of coming back to people that might be important to us. So I like the way that the discussion group brought up these four different concepts of uh, family continuum, right? Um, so one way that you might think about incorporating this is that if you're working with a family member on your final essay, you might think about what family model or continuum of communication would best define your relationship and how that impacts the topics that you choose to discuss, your openness in discussing those topics, and so on. So these relationships are in many ways defined by this idea of socio-orientation and concept orientation, right? So if you have a low uh, socio-orientation but a high concept orientation, right, um, you tend to have uh, this idea of pluralistic family. And in a pluralistic family, right, it's a very kind of democratic form of family relationships. That is, um, people are talking very openly about issues that they might disagree about. There's this very kind of letting all the uh, thoughts and feelings that might be held at the time coming out. Modern Family was a really good example of that, right, because there's so much going on. There's, you know, the character toward the end who's like saying, hey, you should punch each other more. Right? There's uh, two people talking about um, who they're attracted to in the relationships. There's kind of an open discussion about issues of gender and sexuality. Right? So there's a lot of openness and willingness to talk about and discuss issues with people. And again, these continuums can change over time. Right? Uh, for instance, maybe a family is very kind of pluralistic and open in what they talk about. But um, somebody like a relative, like a grandmother, is coming over and the mood shifts and maybe there's a focus on more formal communication. Laissez-faire is the idea that essentially family members are very independent. They're doing their own thing a lot of the time, right? So in a laissez-faire family, um, there's a really big focus on family members just kind of living their own independent lives, of not really connecting to each other a whole lot, um, and when they do have connections, they can at times feel kind of brief or superficial. A couple examples that immediately come to mind. Um, if you've ever seen the TV show Jet Creek, one of my favorite shows, um, the very beginning of the series, right, starts with a rich family who's very detached and is doing their own thing and is essentially forced to live together, right, and get to know each other again when they lose a bunch of money and they have to move to a town in the middle of nowhere. Another example, right, would be the show Arrested Development. If you've seen the show, right, it's kind of a similar premise, but it's a rich family that loses money and sort of has to relate to each other again. So we see a lot of laissez-faire family relationships depicted on screen, where people are off doing their own things, and a lot of the comedy comes up because you're forcing family members to get back together and to have more relationships with each other. Under the idea of a consensual family, right, um, this gets at the role of hierarchy. So. In a consensual family, there is high social orientation. That is, there's high structure, but at the same time, there's openness to communicate. So one way of thinking about uh, a consensual family is that there is um, sort of a defined structure. You don't necessarily like um, talk back or um, you know 
vocally express disagreement in a lot of situations, but there's still a space for discussion, right? Under this model, uh, there's hierarchy. There's clearly defined roles among the family members, right? Who is taking care of each other, who is bringing in money, and so on. But there's still a space for people to actively communicate. So there's still an opportunity to discuss issues as they come up, um, and a level of comfort in doing so. And then lastly, under a protective family, generally speaking, right, there's a lot of um, concern about how people are portraying um, their relationships, but also under this model, under a protective family, there's hierarchy, but also not a whole lot of communication or open dialogue. One way of thinking about a protective family is the idea, oh, we don't talk about this, um, where there might be a lot of self-censorship of more personal or intimate topics, right? If somebody is coming out in terms of identifying gender, sexuality, attraction, and so on, there might be a lot more burden or concern with outing and sharing because of the range of issues that are considered acceptable under that model. So these different continuums, again, can change over time as families change, but what they show us is that there's different levels of structure in the relationships and also different levels of disclosure and conversation that happen in the relationships, too. As I mentioned before, uh, one of the easiest ways to think about family systems theory is to think about a bunch of gears and cogs turning together. Again, if you think about some of your favorite shows that maybe involve either a direct um, blood-related or chosen family, a lot of the humor comes from getting to know these characters and seeing them bounce off of each other and seeing the relationships among these characters, right? For instance, if you've seen the TV show Community, uh, while it's not necessarily a formal family structure, uh, in many ways it fits under the idea of a chosen family, right? Where the characters kind of have this steady group and a branching friendship that many of them are able to relate to with one another. And so, under something like family systems theory, we can understand that there's both these elements of people being alone, but also family, and seeing the importance of connection that members of a group have toward one another. I thought that the discussion group did a good job of going over these seven different major elements of um, family, and I just kind of want to recap some key things to know about these. Again, these characteristics are ways that you could think about if you're looking at your family relationships a little bit better. Um, how interdependent are your family members? So how much are you directly connecting and working with each other versus alone? Wholeness, right? How sort of complete does it feel within the family structure? What patterns, regularities happen? Is it kind of anything goes? Or are there traditions that you do? Maybe you go around on Thanksgiving and say what you're thankful for. Interactive complexity. What range of actions and things can you do with your family? Maybe you are fairly structured and only do things like going to church or have dinner, or maybe you do a lot of different activities. How open are you in terms of the topics and issues that you choose to discuss? How complex are the relationships? So how much do you disclose? How much history is there? And the equifinality suggests that there's a lot of different ways that the family relationship could develop or change over time. So I thought the modern family example was a really good one. Um, I would point to a couple other examples of how family is depicted through media. Uh, one of the examples is if you've seen the ABC show Fresh Off the Boat, right? It's a family uh, moving to the United States and dealing with a unique set of cultural differences. Uh, one Day at a Time, which was recently canceled, is another example of kind of non-traditional and unique elements of family relationships. So I want to show just kind of a couple quick clips from these. Now to come to a place where we know nothing and where the humidity is not good for my hair. 
This is my mom. My dad's American dream was her nightmare. Where are all the customers? There is hardly anyone here, and that table is only drinking water. Hey, why you not drink beer? Me? My American dream is to fit in. Why do all your shirts have black men on them? It's a tourist B.I.G. You need B.I.G.? Yeah, man. Come sit with us. Oh, what is it? It's Chinese food. Get it out of here. Ying Ming's eating worms. I need white people lunch. What is... So, uh, kind of a fun example. Uh, because, right, one of the major differences that we might see in culture and identity is adjustment to new spaces. Uh, for instance, a lot of families and cultures see generational differences in English, maybe not being the first language for parents, but English being the first language for a child. Um, the challenges of adjusting to a new culture, but also maintaining things like cultural tradition, um, different views about integration within cultures versus maintaining independence, um, and the challenges of finding social relationships, including friends, while at the same time finding somebody's culture um, and continuing that within them, right? Uh, when somebody's lunch is made fun of, uh, and the cultural components of that um, are on display in an example like that, we can see some of the challenges that members of a family might have. So what's this history project you're working on? And then maybe later you can show me how to turn into a band. Your mom's kind of mean. I'm obsessed with her. I swear to God, if that Vieja calls me Maria one more time. Mrs. Doyle has Alzheimer's. Oh, no, I'm so sorry. Hey, I'm messing with you. She's just racist. What happened to your face? What happened to your face? I'm sorry. I was hanging out with my friends and taught you to turn it on. Well, we already booked the room, and I found a great band. Okay, it's your brother with an iPod and a playlist, but it's a very good playlist. <laughs> I went to war, I got hurt, and when I came back, there was some organization set up to help me and other veterans get the help we need. So one thing that really stands out to me in this example, right, is the way that uh, culture uh, is generational, right? So you have the kind of grandmother who has a lot of uh, traditions. You have the mother character who, in many ways, as a veteran, is coming back and readjusting. And you have a lot of differences in how the kids are acting and uh, adjusting to the world. So we see a lot of these generational cultural challenges depicted in media. We see the role that things such as cultural identity might play in relationships with family. We see a lot of differences in openness and structure that might or might not be present. One of the major examples, for instance, in Fresh Off the Boat is that family members might not feel comfortable talking with each other about some of the challenges like going to school, um, dealing with racism at school, and so on. So the degree of disclosure that people might have about those topics is oftentimes used for comic effect, but is also um, something that we see depicted in a lot of different ways on film. So these are some other examples to help us think about how some of these elements of family communication are at play. There's also this idea of a genogram. Right? A genogram is a way to kind of visually represent the relationships that family members have. Um, for instance, uh, a triangle, right, or set of three, um, can be both a positive and toxic uh, element of a lot of families, right, where it feels at times like two people are ganging up on one person, uh, or uh, disagreements are resolved by, like, the majority. So groups of three can be a challenge, uh, but we can kind of see over time that family members are able to reconcile the differences and maintain inclusion among um, and despite some of these uh, issues as well. So what I'd like you to do in the remaining few minutes of class is to take some time on your own. You can write or type this for attendance today. And I'd like you to describe in your own words what family means to you. And next, pick two of these characteristics of family systems theory and explain how they might apply to uh, you. So I'll give you some time to work on that.